Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the first Sunday conversation of 2023, presented by the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, also known as Mass ME. Today's program is titled Selected Readings from the Long Hall with Ryan Pryor and Cynthia Adenig. And here is Ryan Pryor's book. I'll hold it up again later. We hope you consider buying it. And also, if you do, we hope you consider buying it from our partner, the independent bookstore, Button Woods Books. A link for a 15% discount is on the MassME website. So I'm Rivka Solomon. I'm a proud member of MassME and a decades-long ME CFS advocate who is now working on long COVID advocacy as well. I've done this work both with MassME and independently, and I will be the moderator for today's event. So for those of you who are new to MECFS, it stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. Most of us just call it ME. Uh, it's a devastating chronic illness with immunological and neurological abnormalities, and there's no diagnostic test, no FDA approved treatment, and no known cure. Meanwhile, long COVID is a post COVID illness with similarities to MECFS, and we're going to be hearing more about that. Now I'm going to introduce the speakers. I'm excited to have this conversation today with Ryan and Cynthia. I really respect both of them as colleagues and fellow advocates in the MECFS and long COVID communities. So first, Ryan. Uh, Ryan is a journalist and author who works for CNN and the think tank, The Century Foundation. His long history of MECFS advocacy includes directing Forgotten Plague, a feature length documentary about his own journey as an MECFS patient. And Mass, Mass ME had the honor of premiering this in 2015. And now Ryan has written a book, The Long Haul, Solving the Puzzle of the Pandemic's Long Haulers and How They Are Changing Healthcare Forever. And I just finished it and I'm very, I, I think it's a great book and I highly recommend it. Also speaking today is Cynthia Adenig. Cynthia became a long COVID advocate after her own personal experience battling bias while attempting to obtain medical care. She's featured in Ryan's book. Her wide ranging advocacy includes work on Capitol Hill, working with MECFS and long COVID researchers to improve racial and disability inclusion for research studies. And Cynthia also co-founded BIPOC Equity Agency, a multidisciplinary consulting agency advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. And I'm proud to say that Cynthia is also a friend, as is Ryan. Uh, so before we dive into the readings from Ryan's book and the discussion with, with Ryan and Cynthia, I want to give a bit of context for today's event. So I was allotted four minutes for this, and here we go. So what does the research on post-epidemic and post-infection recovery show us. It shows us that long COVID is nothing new. Historically speaking, research shows that infections people get from viruses and bacteria can leave a, in their wake a percentage of people who get sick and stay sick with a chronic illness. That's my personal story as well. This has been true with many viruses, including SARS, MERS, West Nile virus, H1N1 flu, Ebola, and of course, Epstein-Barr virus. And a long-term chronic illness is also possible due to, due to the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. The actual percentage of people who get an infection and stay sick seem to range between 10 to 25%. And for those who stay sick, what does their chronic illness look like? Well, they have symptoms that we associate with MECFS. They have unrelenting exhaustion, cognitive dysfunction, non-restorative sleep, and PEM or post-exertional malaise. And that's a worsening of their illness after even minor activity. So the fact that we're seeing similar chronic illness following COVID is not a surprise. I feel like this was best summarized by microbiologist Amy Prowell of the PolyBio Foundation and the Long COVID Research Initiative when she said, quote, 
If COVID didn't cause chronic symptoms to occur in some people, it would be the only virus that didn't do that. So long COVID was no surprise. Many researchers and government officials think ME and long COVID are so similar that they, that they could be one and the same. Of course, we don't know, only time and research can will tell. Meanwhile, many with long COVID are now meeting the diagnostic criteria for ME and they're getting an ME diagnosis. I need to add one important note here. 80% uh, of people with ME say they got ME after a viral or bacterial infection, but that means 20% of people with ME cannot link their ME, link their ME to a virus or a bacteria. And we wanna be sure to keep including that 20% in our discussions about ME. Let's leave no one behind. Meanwhile, meanwhile, it's interesting to learn that some people with long COVID got long COVID after an asymptomatic infection. So perhaps asymptomatic infections played a role in some cases of ME. Unfortunately, we don't know the answer and a slew to that question and a slew of other great questions about ME and long COVID, or let's say ME. We don't know the answer to that question, a slew of other great questions about ME, because sadly for decades, the National Institutes of Health has chosen to not invest much money into researching ME. A note about numbers, pre-pandemic, the US Centers for Disease Control said that there were up to two and a half million people in the US with ME and about uh, it's estimated to be about 24 million around the globe. And in terms of long COVID, the US Government Accounting Office estimates seven to 23 million people in the US have long COVID. Um, and as mentioned before, many people with long COVID are now getting an ME diagnosis. So that's it for my little uh, uh, putting everything in context at the beginning. Let's dive into the event. So Ryan, hi. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, so glad thank to you. have you. So thank in you. a few sentences, uh, tell us a little bit about your book, including why you wrote it and what were your hopes for the book? Um, yeah, so the book is called um, The Long Haul, Solving the Puzzle of the Pandemic's Long Haulers and uh, How They're Changing Healthcare Forever. Um, and it was just reflecting as, as you were talking that um, I, I think I first got in touch with the Mass ME Association back in 2013 or so. So it's almost, uh, we can now say that we've got about a decade of, of collaboration under our belts. And so um, that's exciting. And um, my plan... Um, all of my life was to be um, a writer and then therefore to be an author. And uh, as a journalist, um, it's most important to me to write about the most um, pertinent topics um, globally to affect the most number of people, but also figuring out um, how does my specific skill uh, meet the world's greatest need? And that's where um, long COVID um, was clearly the um, a place where I wanted to make an impact with, um, this is my, my first book and it, there may be, more on the way, but um, this was the way that I felt like I could make the most um, impact on the world um, as a reporter um, for CNN. And I wanna read, um, this is a, um, the, the book was just recently excerpted in Newsweek magazine and it has this, this title, um, How Long COVID is Changing Healthcare. And I think that um, it's true that it, it is changing healthcare and, and changing society. Um, and there's long-term repercussions for, um, uh, for how COVID is going to affect us for, for decades to come. Um, and so I'll, I'll read a quote from um, uh, the Newsweek interview about um, why I wanted to write this book. Uh, and they asked, um, how is long COVID revolutionizing our understanding of disability? COVID, and, and I said, COVID is a mass disabling event. It's catalyzing the next generation of the disability movement. This has happened in previous generations with polio and HIV. In the 1980s, AIDS activists shook up healthcare COVID long haulers are doing the same thing, pointing out the limits in, of our disability system. In having empathy for sufferers, we, cha we challenge tired tropes about makers and fakers and takers. Disability rights are human rights. No matter what disease we have, we have a God-given right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. I wrote this book because I believe in the dignity of the sick. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, um, that's really wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. So I think now we're gonna dive into three excerpts from the book. Uh, Ryan will read one first, then Cynthia, then uh, Ryan again. So um, Ryan, uh, is there anything you wanna say about this excerpt before you dive into reading it? 
this extra um, is from starts with page 59 and it talks about the um, what I feel like is the center of the story um, related to uh, body politic, which is a support group for um, long haul COVID patients on Slack um, and then the patient led research collaborative. And so my um, instinct as a reporter and really my, my, my calling, but also my um, the uh, requirement of the job is to reach out on short notice to the greatest expert in the world on a given topic and write. Um, do the reporting, do the writing, and get get the piece edited and published published um, on deadline. And in this case, um, as I was following um, long COVID, um, the the experts were actually the patients, and where I was going to get the best information was actually going to come from uh, support groups. And um, one of the uh, the book tells a story of of uh, Fiona Lowenstein, who was a founder of um, this important support group, Body Politic, which had come to um, uh, help advise um, a number of federal agencies. And so as a, as a reporter, I needed to get to the heart of the story. Um, and what was where was this human element of action and what was instigating change and uh, which, which is really which, where was the insight um, about what long COVID was. Um, and I wanna uh, uh, read this, it's a couple of pages. It, it explains um, what I hope might be the uh, particular pivot point around ultimately where scientific history uh, pivots. And I think it, um, uh, there's a, a key moment happening here. Um, and Fiona Lowenstein writes uh, an op-ed in the New York Times after getting sick with, with COVID and, and not getting better after a few weeks. Um, and then um, a, a change begins to get sparked. And it says, after Lowenstein's op-ed was published, uh, another advocate, Gina Ossoff, piled into the Slack support group with thousands of others. She was amazed to find hundreds of other others reporting similar stories the symptoms doctors told them couldn't possibly be explained by COVID. But clearly, here they all were. She posed the question of creating a survey, which they built in two days using Google Forms. Participants answered a long list of questions on topics including their testing status, the duration and range of their symptoms, their level of physical capacity or ability to work, and whether they were hospitalized. Most weren't. There, there was nothing online for us, nothing except for the article that Fiona wrote Ossoff said, there wasn't anything about what this was for people who were supposedly healthy. You heard a lot of the trauma cases, but there's nothing about people like us who weren't getting better. You felt the urgency. Where were the doctors? Where was the medical information? Where were the experts? Most participants found the survey through the Slack group. They also posted the survey link to other social media sites targeting those with COVID-19 symptoms uh, extending beyond two weeks. Lisa McCorkle, 28, who was finishing a master's degree in public policy from the University of California at Berkeley, offered to help analyze the incoming research data. In the ensuing months and years, she would use that background to serve as the group's point person in matters related to communicating the needs of patients to various US government agencies. Hannah Way, a Canadian product con consultant, was working on a symptom tracker. She believed she was likely infected on a flight from Taiwan to Vancouver in mid-March, 2020. Like Lowenstein, she had gone to the ER for shortness of breath and witnessed an entire health system in chaos firsthand. I remember sitting in the waiting room and there were other people just like me who were just as young, who were coughing their lungs out, she told me. Wei managed to get a lung x-ray, which showed viral abnormalities, but she was ultimately sent home without receiving a test as all of that Vancouver hospital's tests had gone to Washington State, where the virus was more rampant. Although she got nothing in the way of treatment, the experience was valuable for other reading, for other reasons. I got to see what was really going on, she said. I think that was the most important thing that left me with a really big impression on what's actually going on versus what was in the news. Athena Akrami, a neuroscientist with a lab at University College London joined the Slack group in the wake of her long haul symptoms. She noticed the survey, offered to help, and was given access to the private research channel. As a professor, she had experience with computation, machine learning, data analysis, and statistical modeling. And she could use her university position to seek ethical approval to ultimately publish the data. She jumped in for an intense week of data analysis processing the trove of information gathered in the survey. Those five sick women, Davis, Ossoff, and McCorkle in the US, 
Wei in Canada, and Akrami in the UK, form the core of one of the most significant acts of patient activism in recent history. Their research clout would help guide decisions in national capitals the world over, while also changing countless individual lives with the simple power of validation. The circumstances that brought us together in an informal setting were what made it unique, Asaf said. One of the reasons why we were able to do this was we were a desperate group of people. They had bootstrapped a multidisciplinary team with each bringing a particular skill set in research, design, policy, and analysis. The quintet was imbued with a collaborative spirit, making decisions together without ego or drama. Their methods adhere to the same standards and rigor of scientific research from a university lab. All of them were, in fact, trained researchers whose destinies just happened to converge during a particularly urgent time in the same virtual place. Now, certainly there are limitations to how representative a self-reported symptom survey shared on social media can be, but during the health, public health emergency, their patient-centric participatory model provided an insight about a new emerging disease, particularly among non-hospitalized patients that could never have happened so early any other way. It may hold true that as new diseases rapidly emerge, where patients go, science and policy follow. In a year in which nearly all human interactions shifted to be physically distant or remote, it was an essential service in first describing the collective plights of millions. It's really magical and I don't understand how it happened, Davis said. They uploaded the analysis on May 11th, 2020 in the middle of lockdown. It was originally just shareable through Google Drive before they posted the survey on the new website for what they deemed the patient-led research collaborative. The survey generated 640 responses in 12 days. The data showed that 91% of patients in the group reported not recovering from the virus. Um, and it goes on from there. And yeah. uh, you know, in between ha having uh, Fiona Lowenstein publish her New York Times op-ed, um, and then this patient survey gets picked up by um, Ed Young, uh, who writes about it for the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, and that, um, at, from, at that point, the, the long haul COVID mo movement uh, was born. That is fantastic, Ryan. Thank you. I remember reading, I remember as an ME patient, reading some of those very early news articles, um, including with Laura, uh, Lauren Nichols, uh, talking mm -hmm. about her experiences as a patient. So uh, this was really, really great that you read that and really um, it's uh, powerful to see history happen like that. So now let's say hello to Cynthia. Uh, Ryan, if you don't mind muting yourself and Cynthia, unmute. Hi, yes. Cynthia. Hi. It's so great to have you here. Um, I miss your face. <laughs> it's wonderful to see your face. So um, Cynthia and I have had the pleasure to work together with uh, on other projects, so it's wonderful. So Cynthia, um, you are going to read an excerpt from the book. Would you like to frame it at all or tell us anything about what you're going to be reading? Yes, um, I, I I was one of, I think really the first people to interview with Ryan um, when he was still hashing out what the concept of the book. And so we spent a lot of time going through some really, really deep dives in my experience that I haven't been able to talk about in those smaller news articles that have this predetermined subject matter. And so I was really excited that he actually included um, everything that I found was really, really important. Um, talking about mental health, talking about family structure. Um, we'll also be talking about my experiences with different traumas prior to um, COVID and long COVID and how that pays a factor in, in my lens and my, my experience um, fighting for my life or care. Um, as, and for those of you guys who don't know, um, I first got into the scene of the media when um, I was threatened with arrest for seeking care for my long COVID symptoms back in 2020. Um, and I continue to have um, issues when it comes to police and um, policing black bodies. So I'll, I will start reading what's in the book. It's um, page 191. Let, let me mention one thing about this excerpt that you're going to read, which yes. is that it's very interesting because uh, you interviewed with Ryan and he wrote about you. And now you're going to be reading 
uh, what he wrote about you. So it's going to be including some of Ryan's words and some of your own words as the interviewee. So thank you. Yes. Thank you for, for clearing that, clarifying that. So I'll start. It's called Intersections of Disbelief. If having a debilitating condition that's poorly understood by medical science isn't already difficult enough, having long COVID as a Black woman adds another layer of struggle, compounding what we know about the history of medical neglect and mistrust amongst communities of color. Cynthia Adenig, a 34-year-old graphic designer from Alexandria, Virginia, got sick on March 2020. March 20, 2020, not long after she joined the Long Haul COVID Fighters Group on Facebook. The members exchanged research papers characterizing past pandemics. They found recent studies of post Ebola survivors, suggesting that most of them got better after six months. And at first, hoped that this would that, that would be their illness trajectory as well. But the idea of recovery after COVID was a mirage for many of them. You could see the panic and the grieving, she said. It became clear that long haul meant long haul. It was like, whoa, 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 are we all going to die? And that's one of the things we talk about, a lot about in the group. Like, is this ticking time bomb? Are we all waiting to die? Is there going to be a mass? die off however many months down the road because our body is so wrecked. Chronic illness, though, doesn't necessarily finish off its victims, prompting harder questions about enduring a future of pain and suffering. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Albert Camus wrote in 1942, judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental questions of philosophy. The problem of suicide is also a daily question for many of those in long COVID support groups. If I can't form sentences, I'd rather not live, Adonik told me. Her sister had died prior to the pandemic, leaving her mother depressed for about a year and a half and at times becoming suicidal. Adenik wouldn't tell her mother how severely COVID was affecting her for fear of adding to her already sizable emotional burden. I didn't die because I knew. I know it would like break, break her. I made sure to live to make sure that she lived. And while sitting out of nowhere, she could feel sensation she referred to as the climb. Her heart rate rising up from normal to the range of 150 beats per minute. It was as though she was in a brisk run rather than simply sitting still. She had to relearn how to walk twice and didn't know if she could live with the privilege of being able to predict what she could accomplish from one day to the next. I used to go to sleep every night for well over a year without knowing I was going to wake up, she said. She developed violent food allergies which restricted her diet to only four main food groups, eggs, black beans, corn, and chicken, all prepared plainly with no spices. Anything else triggers significant reactions. COVID assault, COVID assault on her body damaged her esophagus leading to an esophageal tear that made it painful every time she swallowed. That, as well as her mast cell activation problems, triggered starvation and dehydration. Those conditions, in turn, could spike her heart rate, exacerbating her problems with POTS. Grieving that old life was really, really rough, she told me. I may have had my last birthday with a birthday cake and ice cream. I may have had my last holiday of turkey and macaroni and cheese. And I didn't know that. I may have had my last New Year's with eggnog. I may have had my last meal that I'll make for my child. It's not just that I can't eat food. I can't be around cooking. So that means I may have had my last visit to a restaurant. 
I may have had my last visit to a family gathering. If I could turn back time, I would have way more banana bread. Beyond just living, beyond just having a debilitating disease, Adnet described forms of medical racism. She felt disbelieved due to the color of her skin and was drug tested at emergency room more than once. When the medical system discards us like trash and abuses us, it feels like rape. And as a victim of rape, I know what that feels like. Honestly, it feels like that. When you have someone of power steal your trust, and then you're powerless to do anything, that to me is rape. I don't say it lightly, but that's what it feels like. It's that traumatic to continue to know that you need help, that the system you rely on to do the right thing for your body, I have no choice but to trust they will care for me. To constantly have to give your trust to your abuser for the sake of your life, that's a traumatic experience. As horrifying as it was, she understood her experiences weren't uncommon and were downstream effects in a larger scope of history in which previous generations of Black people have been treated even worse. Our ancestors want us to persevere, she said. They did not get through slavery for us to be brought down by gaslighting. They did not pick all the cotton. They did not survive all those beatings just for me to be so mentally destroyed by the medical system, just to say I give up. I will never, I will never. She vowed to do as much as she could to drive change on a broader scale while living with the fact that she didn't know how much time she had left. Advocates connected her to local Congressman Representative Don Beyer. She helped advise the legislative team and as they constructed the Long Haulers Act, a $93 million piece of legislation with appropriations across several federal health agencies. And as a political nerd, she had a hobby of reading Supreme Court cases and considered legislation her happy place. I gave it a nice black set of eyes, she told me. Thank you, Cynthia. Wow. Okay. Um, excellent reading. So I just want to remind people who are listening that when Cynthia said she and her, she was talking about herself because this was from an interview that Ryan conducted with her. Um, so thank you, Cynthia, for reading about yourself that way. Um, and I also just want to say that it's yes. you know very powerful as a person with ME to hear what you're saying, what you're reading. Um, in large part because we saw this coming, the ME community saw this coming, and we worked as hard as we could uh, to get the government to pay attention uh, and do something for long COVID. And uh, I just want you to know how hard we in the ME community have been working, and we didn't want to meet you. Of course, we're thrilled that we have met you, but we wish we, we never had had to meet you this way. Um, okay, we've got our last excerpt. Uh, Ryan, um, anything you want to tell us before you read this uh, final excerpt, and then we'll, we'd move on to the discussion, the questions. Ryan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just first of all, thank you, Cynthia, for um, reading that. I just, I've you know spent uh, so long uh, on the editing um, the book, and um, it just it's incredible to to hear you read it in your own words, and I just found that incredibly moving yeah so thank you for the interviews early on and thank you for the deep dive and for sharing your story with me and um no it's rewarding to to, 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 to be with you now to um see all, all this come full circle um and speaking of full circle this 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 next passage uh that talks about the legislation that, that cynthia um helped work on um and it, it also talks about um, some of the leadership that rivka solomon has had um over the past few decades and uh, uh the, the 
so the bond between uh, ME advocates and, and long COVID advocates and how um, those with post-viral syndromes can, can unite to, to forge the, the future of healthcare. Um, and so the, this, this section is uh, from page 84. Uh, it says, um, the subhead says, uh, an opening for a forgotten illness. Before COVID-19, those of us with chronic illnesses like ME-CFS and scientists researching those illnesses had already been in a kind of trench warfare with public health agencies for decades. Now millions were developing problems that looked just like ME-CFS, all from the same virus, all at the same time. One lifelong advocate, Rivka Solomon, herself an Epstein-Barr virus, long hauler, since six since the 1980s, summed up the situation neatly on a PBS NewsHour segment in April, 2021. It is beautiful to see this. It's like the old timers helping the newbies, but the newbies have much more political clout and are also helping us. The rarity of the opportunity wasn't lost on Alison Zabrana, who was also not quite an old timer, but not quite a newbie either. Alison Zabrana is a, um, a person with MECFS. We're getting a lot of attention and invitations from federal agencies, Sabrana said, agencies who all had previously not treated people with ME well at all, CDC, NIH, et cetera. All of a sudden, I was boots on the ground and leadership within this organization that was getting the red carpet treatment rolled out for them by the NIH, by the CDC, by the World Health Organization. It was like, oh my God, this is the opportunity of a lifetime for a person with ME knowing what our history has been. When those groups are rolling out the red carpet for us, obviously we need to take the opportunity, but is our responsibility to hold that door open and get as many people, advocates from chronic illness communities like dysautonomia, mast cell activation syndrome, whatever, through the door behind us as possible before it is closed. The Solve ME initiative founded in 1987 and the oldest running US patient organization operating in the space saw the historic opening to reframe the whole political conversation about post-viral disease. They pivoted to campaign for proper research funding into long COVID and most importantly, actually helping chronically sick people improve. They cheered when Congress included the large $1.15 billion check for research into the long-term effects of COVID infection over four years, which was passed as part of President Biden's massive 1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan stimulus bill. Solve Me also worked with Representative Jack Bergman and Democratic Rep Don Beyer, who's Cynthia's congressman, to introduce the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act, a $93 million piece of legislation. The additional bill, if passed, would allocate funding for other health agencies with $13 million for development of patient regist registries and biobanks via the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. The proposed legislation also sought $33 million for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to research and provide recommendation, including improving healthcare access for veterans, low-income communities, the disabled, and elderly communities. The Long Haulers Act also called for $30 million to go to the CDC to help educate long COVID patients, medical providers, and the public about symptoms, treatments, and conditions related to long COVID. The bill's most ardent champion was Emily Taylor, who had been working as the advocacy director for the Solve ME initiative for five years, starting on her birthday in June 2016. After working in advocacy for a group catering to Black and Latino children with autism, she moved to join Solve ME to help her mother, who had been stricken with ME CFS in 2008, and for whom Taylor was a caregiver. In those five years with the group, she hit a lot of roadblocks in her battle for more research funding, with even a few million dollars counting as a big success. So-called invisible illnesses seemed nebulous and hard to define. Only about a fifth of the more than 1 million Americans with ME-CFS have received an accurate diagnosis, according to the National Academy of Medicine. When people got sick, they often stayed sick long term. There was no relay for life or walk to end Alzheimer's, and few, if any, fully recovered survivors were able to go out and raise awareness or funding. An interest group couldn't thrive on Capitol Hill if patients couldn't actually get diagnosed in their doctor's offices. From that vantage point, Taylor saw how scientific research was more successful the more targeted it was. 
Therefore, the problem of winning funding that might one day cure her mother's multi-system illness was tied to how research funding could be isolated in individual domains or silos. Private foundations and the government gravitated towards specific projects focused on specific organs or specific diseases, but MECFS could possibly be rooted in a range of different specialties. In October 2019, on her last advocacy trip to Washington before the pandemic lockdowns, a congressional staffer asked her if the problem was so big, why was nobody talking about it? If all of these people got sick at the same time or in the same place, this would be on the front page of every newspaper in the United States, she told him. A few months later, future long haulers all started getting sick. I'll stop there. Yep, that is what happened. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, so very powerful, right? Um, I think that it's really true what Emily Taylor said uh, in that quote. So thank you all very much, uh, Ryan and uh, Cynthia for reading excerpts from The Long Haul. Thank you, Ryan, for writing the book. So now we're gonna dive into the uh, discussion section. Uh, first, I've got four questions um, that uh, the, the speakers and uh, the organizing team for Sunday Conversations came up with that we thought would really uh, help start uh, this conversation. So these are big questions and uh, but we're asking uh, Ryan and Cynthia to, uh, we're unreasonably asking each to keep their uh, responses to three minutes if possible. So the first question goes to Ryan, then the next two would go to Cynthia and then Ryan again, and then we're gonna open it up to uh, questions from uh, the audience. So please put in uh, your questions in the chat um, and put uh, ad address them to everybody. Okay, so Ryan, first question to you. Uh, long COVID is in the news every day. So let's acknowledge the feelings that some people with ME may have that people with long COVID are getting all the attention and the funding. Uh, with that, how do the ME and long COVID communities work together? How do these two diseases that are so similar and that some think are the same inform each other and coexist? How can we uh, have positive synergy between ME and long COVID, and of course the other associated diseases. Um, what are the opportunities that ME and long COVID have to work together? So Ryan, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, so it's it's a rich question, and um, you know, partly it is uh, you know exemplified by the collaboration between um, you know Rivka and Cynthia, that the um, you know, new you know the newbies helping the old timers and old timers helping the newbies, and this this being a, a two way street of um, uh, wisdom on the one hand and political capital uh, on the other. So that the, um, there's, if you if you type in long COVID into uh, Google News um, at any given point, you you'll get a you know really a buffet of articles published even in that last week by frequently pretty pretty major uh, publications. And um, what and I'm on the board of um, ME Action Network, and um, one of the um, um, you know, key art aspects of our work is led by Adrian Tillman, who's a, who does a lot of the press outreach for us and um, has been really adamant about getting Emmy um, presented in as many articles as possible and has a great track record with uh, reporters from, you know, in my case, uh, CNN and uh, Time Magazine, uh, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, on down the list of um, making sure that um, anytime long COVID is mentioned that uh, MECFS ought to be mentioned too. Uh, this trademark um, uh, condition, uh, symptom of post-exertional malaise, um, and then therefore the, um, uh, the the treatment, the uh, pacing um, being one of the most important ways to manage manage the symptoms. And um, I think that in all, Cynthia will have a, a lot to say here too. But the the, um, the life giving and life saving aspect of, of patient communities and um, the ways that um, hundreds if not thousands of people within me came to aid those with long COVID to explain um, the path that they had uh, unfortunately gone gone down for months, years, and sometimes decades, uh, and that those hard-won lessons uh, double back to help um, uh, explain uh, the, the path forward for people with long COVID. Uh, and sim similarly, the um, long COVID um, had so much attention that that's where um, there needs to be uh, could, this idea that Alison Sobrano talks about of, of bringing um, not just MECFS communities, but um, a whole host of, of chronic illnesses um, 
forward uh, that these are all triggered by viruses or by uh, bacterial infections, some form of an infection that um, either becomes uh, persistent in the body or triggers an inflammatory response or an autoimmune response. Um, and the people's lives are never the same. And the, 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 so there, there, it requires tremendous um, innovation from the, the medical perspective to actually um, get to the bottom of what, what exactly the biomarkers are. And um, we get into that um, later in the book, but um, uh, so POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia system, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, ehlers Danlos syndrome, uh, ME-CFS, of course, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic Lyme disease, um, and there, there's similarities to uh, multiple sclerosis, um, and there's some similarities to a, a bunch of different neurological diseases. And um, when you understand this as a, a, a infection-associated chronic disease, uh, um, th uh, that sort of helps open up the, the uh, framework for um, that these are specific, that they all, they've all sort of come from a similar um, initiating incident, uh, and they all fit together that they all may have slightly different symptoms, but they're all um, a family of, of diseases. And so it's really important to that ME or long COVID not be siloed and not be not be seen as uh, strange or befuddling, but uh, really part of a predictable playbook. And um, so um, my hope is that in, in writing this book uh, to highlight the, uh, the key role of patient advocates over the years and um, the, the new, supposedly new um, instance of long COVID, um, that there's a, a contextualized in the broader sweep of history and science uh, that it's all makes um, a lot of sense. And um, so I hope, hope people can um, read this and also especially give the book to others who um, might be in positions of power or um, in, in research to um, act on the, these recommendations. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. Cynthia, I'm sure you're itching to answer that question, but we, I want to get to my other question for you. Um, so, uh, but I will say that what, what Ryan just described, I've been a long time ME advocate, and I will say that the, um, the, the, the two groups, uh, long COVID and ME working together has been absolutely beautiful to witness, um, just fantastic. And my personal relationship with Cynthia um, is just one example of many, many, many um, people that are working together uh, like that. So Cynthia, let's get on. I, I know you want to answer this question, but I want to move on to the next question, which is real equally important. So um, this is something that uh, is a topic that I think some people might shy away from, but I think it's really, really important to discuss here. Uh, so I'm going to be blunt and I'm going to state the obvious. And that is um, that I have something I've noticed over the years and that all of us have noticed is that the ME and long COVID communities are quite white. Uh, so my question is, why do you think the ME and long COVID environment is so white, even as the rates of COVID and thus of course long COVID are highest in communities of color? And what can white individuals and ME and long COVID organizations do uh, to make these communities more inclusive and diverse. Um, and I really appreciate you tackling these important questions with us. And Ryan, if you don't mind, let me ask you if you could uh, go on mute. Um, okay, go ahead, Cynthia. Yes, I'm so glad you asked that question because you know, these kind of conversations are really tough to have when you don't have familiarity. And since we've known each other for quite some time now, <laughs> quite some time now, um, we can have this conversation. I can speak candidly, and you know, we've talked extensively about this. Um, part of it is that the organizations are white. Um, hold on, how do you want to say that? I think you just muted yourself. One second. This one second. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, I was saying part of it is that the advocacy space was white by default because people of color were not getting the diagnosis. There was no outreach. There was no um, awareness campaigns to communities of color. And then of course, you know, we go back to those pivotal time in the eighties where it was implied or insinuated by science, a scientist that um, it was a most, MECFS was a mostly white woman's disease. And so it wasn't until the amazing Wilhelmina um, showed up on the on the scene to show that black women were absolutely able to get ME-CFS. Um, but unfortunately, 
she has a different background. She already had a background in science. She had so much privilege that the average black person didn't have. And it took that much just to produce one person in the advocacy space. And then later on along came Ashanti, which again, Ashanti, she was a nurse. So you, it's almost like you have to be really, really immersed in science and research um, just to discover that you have um, MECFS and really fight for that diagnosis. And then at the same time, um, you know, you have that other cultural barriers to, to seeking care um, because of biases. Why would you pay money to um, get the runaround or get gaslit or get told that you are, um, you know, psychologically unstable that puts you at risk of losing your custody of your children, losing your job. So there's so many hurdles. But what what people can actually do to um, help this, because it continues to be an issue, is organizations have to be proactive. Be proactive in seeking out people of color. Help them to become comfortable speaking about their illness. Give them those skills. Give them that reinsurance. Help them find a diagnosis. And then importantly, provide resources for us. We know we are in a safe space as people of color when we see your money go to us. And we need to see that upfront that you're actually investing in more than just talk because a lot of spaces will invest in more than just talk, but in reality, they really aren't invested in our outcomes for the better. And we as people of color can feel that if you're disingenuous. And so um, I would definitely say uh, more always need to be proactive in, in elevating those in the space and, and helping them get those credentials to be set aside NIH to set aside, you know, um, um, CDC directors and, and give a speech and, and those kind of things. And I was a Congress. Okay, that was excellent, Cynthia, and so true, everything you said. And I just want to uh, echo what you just said, which is that this is my thought in terms of white organiz organizations that are predominantly made up of white people right now. In order to be more inclusive and diverse, not only do we need to uh, open the doors, we can't just say our organization is open to everyone, but we actually have to reach out and invite people of color. Um, so as you had said to me before, Cynthia, that people of color will scan the environment and see if it's safe, if there are other people of color there. And, um, and if they are, then they will feel more uh, um, safe uh, for, for joining. Uh, joining in and people with the, the white organizations need to not just open the doors, but actually do the inviting uh, and build relationships, I will say. Uh, bias and prejudice are everywhere. Uh, white privilege is everywhere. It impacts every angle <clears throat> of our society. Um, and so in order to uh, overcome that, we have to do real organizations that are predominantly white have to do real outreach. So Cynthia, we're gonna stick with you for a second with the second question and then we'll go to Ryan with the last um, and then we'll open it up to the um, audience so please put your questions in the chat. So Cynthia in our private conversations uh, you have relayed to, uh, to me and to the Sunday conversation organizers the dangers of simply being black simply existing as a black person in our society and this is something that uh, we've all seen with regards to policing and cops responding to black people with deadly violence. But you told us organizers uh, how this same danger actually also extends to the healthcare setting. And I think that this is something that white folks may not know about. So could you tell us what you mean when you say that it can actually be dangerous to be a black person in a healthcare setting such as an emergency room? Yeah, it is actually extremely dangerous. I learned along the way, I noticed along the way when I would be in the ER, that I would always get sat a few key spaces in the rooms. And um, it was probably earlier this year that I realized that those rooms are exactly right outside of the station where the security guards in the hospital are. And as a nerd, even though my brain was suffering from hypoxia, I always noticed those statistical anomalies. And I'm like, there's no way on God's green earth in a, in a pandemic, I could be routinely sat in the same, the exact same room multiple times, regardless of how packed or how not packed it was, or in specific set, or specific, 
settings that had a lot more traffic um, and, and watchful eyes over um, in those areas. And of course, as um, a lot of you know, I was threatened with arrest, even though um, for seeking care for, for my long COVID symptoms, my oxygen was dropping and my heart rate was up. And at that time, I had declined so badly that I needed a wheelchair to move around. So if you're, how, how threatening can your, must your skin be to be in a wheelchair and still be escorted out by security and threatened to be arrested if I did not allow security to um, to um, push me out. And then that that has I've had other I've had other times where it could have escalated to that. But me as a black person who has experienced this aggressive policing my entire life, including a, a police incidents um, here in Virginia soon after I moved here. Um, I know where and it's leading to that dangerous space. And thankfully I have the cognitive you know, abilities to just bear through the nightmare, not become too emotional or erratic because I know that they have the power to, um, to restrain me in a violent way if they deem it threatening, even though I'm actually just having the same symptoms that someone who was white would have and they would see more as like a hysterical or a nuisance. There's a difference between hysterical and nuisance and there's a difference between aggressive and they treat me as if I'm hostile and aggressive, even if I have no mobility whatsoever. And that's really a testament of just how prevalent that fear is when they see a black body and, and brown skin. Yeah, I just want to, that's really, really, really important that you said all that. And I also wonder if you want to say anything about being drug tested, that, that the distrust of you as a Black woman ran so deep that they didn't trust you saying, I think a lot of us experience that, that we're not trusted in terms of saying what our symptoms are, but I'm just then ignored. But you, it went past ignoring you. They actually drug tested you because they didn't trust you so much. Is that correct? Yeah, not only did they did um, drug test me, they drug tested me three times in a very sh short period of time. I think it's like within like three months, I got drug tested three times. And two of those drug tests were within like a week of each other. And so, uh, and one of, uh, in one of those incidents when I was actually admitted to the hospital, I was only gone for like 24 hours and they still drug tested me. Like, what did you think happened? Like, you, you saw my symptoms before, you ruled it out. You, I've only gone that far. Um, and the, the really, really upsetting part about that was the doctor told me as I was being discharged um, for starvation dehydration, um, you know, after I got actually admitted for several days, he said, if you, if you get worse or you find that you can't, still can't eat, come back. So I was following doctor's orders to come back and they still drug tested me and the messed up part about being black is that in spite of all of the incidences prior it still takes you back and surprises you um because as a black person you still hold out that little bitty hope for humanity that like that, that's not going to happen um but it doesn't mean that because we experience it so often it doesn't hurt it hurts so bad it hurts just every single time of every course. single time it hurts it I hurts for me and, and then I hurt for my friends who tell me these things who don't get the media and I hurt for the future generations the way you guys wanted to prevent that from happening you know I ex recently experienced an incident like that again just a couple of weeks ago and knowing everything that I know and did all the studying that I did into procedures into workarounds into ways to get proper care I still still couldn't save my own life just a couple of weeks ago. I was at the mercy of doctors and nurses and they did not do anything to try to help preserve my life. And so that really shows you that we, I, we have a lot more work to do. It shows you that prejudice and bias and racism is uh, and colorism is alive and well. And thank you so, so, so much for delving into that with us. And the last question goes to Ryan, but I just wanna say we are at the five o'clock mark. So that means that uh, we are officially supposedly uh, over, but the conversation is so rich and so intense that we're going to keep going. Uh, if you need to leave, that's fine. Uh, you can please feel free to watch the recording later. Everyone who registered will be emailed the recording. So the last question before we open it up to the Q&A is to Ryan Pryor. Thank you again, Cynthia. So Ryan, if you could unmute. Um, so let's just talk about next steps. 
um, in your recent interview with Newsweek magazine, and you talked about that a little bit already, you said that we should combine all complex chronic illnesses and post-infectious chronic illnesses and associated illnesses. So by combining them, you meant we should sort of lump them together uh, in the same clinic and under the same roof. So we all know that traditionally, these different illnesses have been siloed separately in terms of healthcare. So if you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you might go there. If you have fibromyalgia, you might go there. Dys dysautonomia, you might see that, doctor. Uh, so, but you're suggesting something new and innovative, which is to treat all of these associated conditions under the same roof and in the same clinic. If you could just tell us a little bit more about why we should conceive of these illnesses um, as being in the same field and how uh, innovative it is, uh, what you're suggesting. Brian. Right. Yeah. And, and just to, um, you know, the, the suggestion is, is grounded in, um, you know, personal lived experience is also grounded in um, understanding the science and the politics and the, um, uh, just the efficiency of, of how to develop a, um, a healthcare model um, that can serve a broad number of people. In as Cynthia was talking, it was it recalling some, some my, parts of my own patient journey, and um, you know Cynthia describes a, a patient journey that was much different you know, as a, as a white male versus a black woman, and um, part of uh, my own track uh, toward getting a diagnosis, my, uh, we were on a, living on the Air Force Base. My dad was a colonel, a high-ranking officer, and we were very afraid of this this idea of not being believed, and. Um, you know, there, there are these tropes around makers and takers and fakers, and, um, and I did not want to be seen as a faker, um, and others get seen as as, as takers or um, the, the rest, and um, um, so my, you know, I would take, took pains to, um, you know, wear, I would, you know, wear a suit and tie to uh, a number of my doctor's appointments to, to be seen as more legitimate. My dad uh, came in his Air Force uniform, came straight from work because uh, he knew that uh, he would be more respected. Um, and we, you know, and my, my mom was there too, who was a nurse and um, had the, my mom had extensive knowledge of how to operate in healthcare bureaucracy. So she was um, an incredible advocate on both of them. And I, I wouldn't have been able to um, get through that experience um, without not just one, one person helping, but two um, highly qualified. Uh, and so that, just to give you a sense of, of how privilege operates and um, where it, um, and how much people need it. Um, and ultimately, we found a clinic um, in Atlanta that uh, treats uh, fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, and, and chronic fatigue syndrome. And um, in my own story, I um, have a very suspicious tick bite that I um, may or may not have triggered uh, chronic Lyme. And then my entire experience with you know what I refer to as CFS and then ME-CFS may have all be, been uh, tracked back to a tick bite at a Boy Scout camp. And um, because these these are nebulous diseases, they all blend together to one degree or another, and they're comorbid conditions. So that um, someone who has MECFS may have fibro, and may have been fibromyalgia, and may have been triggered by Lyme disease, and then they may have developed uh, POTS or mast cell activation syndrome on top of it, um, or they may have had a different trajectory when they have a, connect a connective tissue disorder, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which could be implicated in um, a lot of the symptoms. So that you, you get these people who um, have, have um, it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet of, of diseases, and any given person may have three or four out of the 12 or 15 um, on their particular plate at any given time, and that the illness can morph. Um, so that, that's one aspect of it. Um, it's really important to um, build out uh, these so-called system or uh, centers of excellence so that the, your research and clinical care can happen um, under the same roof. And um, that, that's been a model that works um, on a lot of different diseases and this translational medicine model of um, research informing clinical care and clinical care informing um, research. So making it a two-way street. Um, and then it, it's very difficult to build a, a business model or financial um, set of economic incentives in which it's possible to even treat people when there's not um, a good set of biomarkers and a good set of treatments. Um, and so that's where um, it, it's more effective from a patient um, point of view to be able to have a doctor who can sort of uh, dip into the knowledge of a, a range of chronic illnesses in, in the uh, course of a treatment plan. Um, and it's going to be more effective for the doctors who are um, you know, operating off of an insurance model um, and figuring out billing codes and um, not... Um, separating you know one patient group out from another because it, it's 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 impossible to build um uh, a stable uh clinic and that that's where um 
many of these cl uh, clinics would uh, be at risk of going going out of business. It's very hard for them to stay open unless they're propped up by research dollars or or they have a certain level of uh, economies of scale. Um, uh, so, I, so I, I'm passionate about this topic from a range of different uh, perspectives, but I think that the, um, it's a, a model that would work for doctors, that would work for uh, patients, and would uh, work for researchers. And I think it's uh, politically uh, much more feasible than uh, the sort of uh, inadequate status quo that we currently have. I think that that's exactly right. Thank you, Ryan, for your um, for your vision uh, that you're relaying here. Um, I think that uh, we are going to probably be finding that these comorbid conditions um, uh, are, we're good, people are going to be making the links between them more and more, uh, both patients and researchers. So it's really great to, to hear that, um, to hear your, about more about your vision. Okay, so now we're going to open it up to some people uh, put questions in the chat. Um, some of them are small and some of them are uh, not as small. So um, here we go. Uh, we'll probably be ending at 5.15 or 5.20. So uh, this is, uh, if you can keep your uh, answers short so that um, we can get to as many questions as possible. So here's the first one, if Ryan and Cynthia can both unmute. Uh, Ryan and Cynthia, do you have any suggestions for a good way to stay current with news about and research on both ME and long COVID one, when one's energy is limited? Is there a central gathering place for such news? Cynthia? That's a good question. Um, I have access to a, I don't even know what you would call it. It's kind of like an API, like a curation um, tool through in um, a, through a pharmaceutical company um, that feeds me my news and it learns based on what you like. And so I've been able to curate um, it constantly feeding me MECFS and long COVID articles and research through that. As a nerd on the coding side of world against my will a lot, um, I already knew how to like go through and, and do Google search and highlight that term and have Google um, alert you when a certain term is is um, mentioned, and so you you guys can do that. But I have a little secret weapon. I've been trying to get them to uh, <laughs> to expand on that, and I definitely will be having it on my personal website so that people can um, can do that. If you guys, if I see a need, like if you guys really want, just let me know. I haven't done it. I haven't like posted it because I haven't had anyone ask that. But if that's what you're interested in, I have the tools um, to do that and give that. Extend okay. that to you all for no thank charge, you. of course, because I don't believe in paywalls behind information. So thank you, Cynthia. And also, I'll just add Twitter. If you're open to being on Twitter, uh, Twitter ob obviously has um, a whole lot of uh, great, uh, you know, uh, people are posting about their research, etc. Ryan, do you want to answer that question about a central location to get this uh, information about Emmy and long COVID? Yeah, the, the, you know, there's a few. Um... You know, journalists who are doing a great job covering Jamie Ducharme at, at Time Magazine, uh, Ed Young, who is um, at The Atlantic and is uh, get, getting ready to come back from sabbatical, uh, and Megan O'Rourke, who's written a lot for The Atlantic and who has a nice, a nice book, um, uh, The Invisible Kingdom, which uh, I also recommend and was able to interview her about her book for a podcast. But the number one, oh, follow Hannah Davis on Twitter. She is the, um, the I had someone map out the um, Twitter interactions for long COVID, a uh, healthcare data firm. And uh, Hannah Davis is the um, center of the, the wheel. And uh, she's been uh, exceptional. She was a great source for the book and she'd be a great source to, um, if you follow one person on Twitter, just follow her. Uh, I would, uh, I'm just gonna put her in the chat. Uh, follow Hannah Davis on Twitter, absolutely true. Okay, next question. Um, Let's see, uh, this is a question about treatments. Please keep this short and also know that everybody, we can't recommend treatments, but has anybody found anything that has helped brain fog? Ryan, Cynthia? Um, I don't know any, um, a, a specific uh, term or a specific uh, treatment uh, to recommend. Uh, Cynthia may have more specific uh, information. Okay, but, um, great. Uh, yeah, Cynthia, anything specific to brain fog? Yeah, one of the things you guys pounded into my head early on was that how pervasive brain fog and lack of cognitive um, impairment is really, really a hallmark, long, hard to push 
So I rested that full year, a uh, radical rest. Being the nerd that I was, it was tough. It was tough. I had to watch reality TV. Um, and that was very difficult for someone <laughs> who was used to watching C-SPAN for hours and reading a couple hundred pages of legislation on a Friday night as a way to unwind. Um, I had to give my brain a break. I realized I didn't know how to rest. Um, and thankfully, um, people like Rivka and Wilhelmina and, and Ashanti taught me how to truly rest my brain. Um, and also gave me the, it gave me the freedom to not beat myself up over resting. I thought rest was bad and negative and unproductive and harmful and all those other things society tells you. And I learned that it was good and it was like a type of medicine. So for a full year, I didn't homeschool my son. I didn't read lots of legislation. I didn't read Supreme Court cases, which was really, really difficult and that's political space. Um, for me, I just rested and then slowly over time i started integrating a little bit of chess puzzles a little bit of word puzzles um just just enough to where i would as soon as i start feeling that that pm shut everything down turn it off wait another 24 hours and try again and, and that has to work for me and, and actually it's, I, it's what's worked for my son too who, who i experienced cognitive impairment or this summer his Thank his you. um stuff's coming back Thank you, Cynthia. By the way, for some reason, in my on my screen, you got a little fuzzy, and you're remaining a little fuzzy, and I don't know why. Um, so here's another question. Um, uh, Ryan, what's the name of the Atlantic Clinic that treats these illnesses? The um, the the clinic that I go to, or the um, from the uh, I'm not sure. Um, the um, I'll, I'll just I'll highlight. Um, as someone who's been featured in the Atlantic um, by by Ed Young and Megan O'Rourke is uh, David Petrino, who I think is a really he he leads the Center for um, Post COVID Care, and um, or he's one of the oh the clinic leaders. that you mentioned. Sorry, Ryan. Oh, you na you uh, mentioned a clinic uh, in Atlanta that treats yeah, these illnesses. Yeah, I, I see a doctor named Karen Bullington uh, at what was used to be called the Fibro and Fatigue Clinic, uh, and now it's now it's under uh, Holtorf Medical Center. Okay, do you want to put that in the chat? Um, yeah, I'll write this down. Um, okay, thank you. Oh, and uh, let's keep going uh, because we only have a couple minutes left. Um, uh, what can ME, uh, Mass ME do to add value to the developing uh, long COVID and ME alliance, alliances? How can Mass ME advance its mission by partnering with long COVID initiatives? I don't think we need to answer that here. I think we need to hear that as endorsement of, of the idea of, of having Mass ME work closely with long COVID, folks with long COVID. Um, Cynthia, it, in a very short uh, answer, because this is a very big question, uh, what has helped you to heal from racial trauma? Oh yeah, trauma. Ooh. Trauma therapy has been life, life, life-changing. Um, a lot of us from that first wave especially found that it was just essential for getting our bodies out of that fight or flight mode, out of that hyper vigilant um, mode that exacerbates our our symptoms and contributes to things like you know insomnia. And um, the really messed up part about this is grief is a huge, huge trigger. It's a huge trigger. Um, and so now I've been every time that I feel um, I experience something like a normal grief, like a death in the family or something. Um, I know to turn to trauma therapy because the sooner I get um, through that grief, the better I will be on um, my road to my recovery from my long COVID and ME-CFS and other symptoms. So I couldn't sing its praises more. However you get it, however way you get that trauma therapy, mm -hmm. get the trauma therapy. If you can't afford it, support groups. Um, mm -hmm. Those, those were my lifeline, my, my lifeline, especially that first year. You can't, it's so dark and overwhelming. You can't do this alone. You're not going to come out on that other side intact if you, if you stay isolated. So um, support groups for sure. That's right. Community support is wonderful. Okay. So we are just at the uh, 515, almost at the 515 mark. Uh, Cynthia, people in the chat are asking you if you can put the link in the chat to the news source that you were talking about. And if not, you will you can get a copy of the chat later because people are sending you their email address to have you send it to them. And yeah, I can absolutely. Um, I don't have the link on me because it's like this internal thing okay. that they sent to me. But I can. We'll send. You I the, can give it to Massimi to, to give everyone. Okay, 
And that sounds great. And then other people are weighing in about that they got tick bites too. And of course, there is the the whole theory about the multi-assault or multi-hit theory, which is that there can be multiple times in, in a lifetime in which your immune system is uh, weakened. So you could first have a tick bite when you're younger, and then you could have mono when you are in your teens or your 20s, and then you could uh, get COVID uh, in your 30s. So Okay, so and let's see. I, I like it that yeah. sometimes to, uh, you know, thinking about like a cat has nine lives. And, you know, if you use up one of your hits on COVID, one of them on, on Lyme, um, and if it's only so many times, you can just keep- um, Keep assaulting that immune damage. system, yeah. Or getting pneumonia or getting some other thing. Um, That's and just right. kind of stack up over, over a while. That's right. I mean, I've met so many people with long COVID who told me that they got mono, you know, 10 years earlier, and they just never felt quite right after that. Okay, so that's it. We're at the 515, 516 mark. That's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Ryan and Cynthia, for joining us today for such an open and honest discussion. I think we covered some important topics. I hope we can find ways to, I know we will find ways to continue these discussions because they benefit all of us, especially discussions about um, prejudice, racism, uh, bias, et cetera. As a reminder, the recording of this session will be posted on the Mass ME YouTube channel as soon as we can. The slides will be posted uh, also on the website. Uh, the website is massmecfs.org. Uh, you will get an email when uh, these are up. Please share the video with everybody and your, your friends, your family. And I'm sorry, we jumped uh, before I got to say a proper thank you. So just thank you so much, Ryan and Cynthia. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of this wonderful discussion. Um, uh, I jumped into thank wrapping you. this up before I properly thanked you both. Uh, this was really, really wonderful. Okay, so now uh, on to our next month. Uh, the event that we're doing next month is Pacing 4ME, an occupational therapist and physical therapist perspective on what it is and how you can use pacing in your daily life. Uh, if you have ideas for future programs or speakers, or if you'd like to join the Sunday Conversations team as a volunteer, please email, I hope we can put this in the chat, events at MECFS. Uh, uh, so sorry, hold on. Let me just put it in the chat. Um, please email. Nope, I can't put, yeah, there it is. Please email events at massmecfs.org if you'd like to volunteer with Sunday Conversations. We would love to have you. Uh, Sunday Conversations is not intended to be a series of research presentations, but rather programs that will provide a variety of practical information that patients can use. And then finally, if you found this program worthwhile, there are a few ways that you can help. You may make a donation to help support this series by donating online at the website massmecfs.org slash donate. And I'm going to put that in the chat unless someone already did. No, they didn't. There we go. It's in the chat. Um, and uh, on the same page as that uh, website I just mentioned, that web page I just mentioned, um, excuse me, you can sign up for the MassME newsletter. And if you donate $25 or more uh, and check the option for become a member, uh, that will establish your membership or renew it, and you will be invited to our members only programs. That's it for us. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you again next month. And uh, we're just uh, thrilled to have been able to present this program today. Thank you so much for coming.